Houston. You saw the preseason ad. The Utah Miners football team in well-dressed lines doing conditioning drills in the middle of their winter break. Mike Price looking on sternly from his Durham Center lair, plotting, planning, working. Mission not quite accomplished. Yet here's a statement on the magic of Mike Price. Even after the Miners 4-8 finish for 2007, their worst record under Price yet, he was a legitimate candidate for the head coaching vacancy at Washington State, where he coached prior to coming to El Paso. It's worth noting that what Mike Price did at a backwater school on the wrong side of the mountains and the money in the Pac-10 is borderline miraculous, so much so that they almost brought him back. When Price took the Cougars to the Rose Bowl in 1998, it was Washington State's first in 67 years. It took him 10 years to get there, and it took him another five to get back again. In the meantime, he made Wazoo into the 90s version of Brigham Young, quarterback U, Ryan Leaf, Jason Gesser, and of course Drew Bledsoe, all prospered under Price's system. Although there's no comparing all those UTEP youngsters fumbling around in the middle of a six-game losing skid with Rose Bowl teams, the common thread is that both between and before Price's Cougars were smelling roses, uh, they were smelling something else not nearly as flattering. Price maintains he can do something similar here. And regardless of if Washington State was serious about Mike Price, it was certainly nice for UTEP fans to hear from Price's own mouth that he was not leaving. He really does like it here. Next season, he'll have a talented offense with a quarterback in Trevor Vitito that Price calls the most poised freshman he has ever coached at that position. He will also have a defense that struggled to stop anything, passes most of all. By now, Mike Price is probably wondering what Rube Goldberg contraption he'd have to conjure up just to get his miners to play more consistently. You can almost picture the wadded up pieces of paper around his office wastebasket. Well, obviously, I don't like the idea of us not finishing strong in November. Um, and uh, I don't like the idea of us being a poor defensive team. Um, so we're going to work real hard in the off season to be a better blocking, tackling football team. That's what we need to work on. It's fundamentals, in my opinion. And uh, my opinion counts the most around here. So that's what we're going to be working on. To hear that, it seems more than mere rumor that defensive coordinator Tim Hundley will not return next season. Though Price hasn't talked about it directly, he did say this about the job. It's got to be the roughest job in the country to be a defensive coordinator in this league, all the receivers and running backs. And so it's a, it's a difficult, thankless job. But if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't produce, you don't get it done in, the, in this business, you know, that's, that's what counts, what's on the scoreboard. It really does. You've said you've been uh, through all of this before. How much does that help you in terms of perspective? doesn't help one bit still hurts it's still like uh, um, just because you're experienced um, and have a few losses under your belt doesn't make a loss taste any better so um, I think maybe I'm not gonna panic uh, I know what to do uh, I've come out of this, a hole like this before so I'm confident that we can do it your whole family's here your sons are here, their families, your daughter's here, her family, your wife is here. Does they, how often does that happen, especially in college coaching? I, I don't think that's unprecedented. Well, we're certainly blessed with having our family here, all of our, our, our boys and our daughter and all of our five-and-a-half grandkids, which uh, uh, three will be now born in El Paso, and uh, so we're thrilled about that. And... Um, it helps, I guess, because they're the ones that count the most in your family. But you hate to see your kids hurt, hurting. You hate to see their wives hurting. You hate to see your wife hurting. Your wife hurting, you know. And when you lose games, and when people get down on you, and when things don't don't go right, uh, if it was just you, one person, it would be a lot different. But as you know, Duke, growing up in athletics, you know, you've been around coaches all your life, and you know how it's not just the coach, it's the whole family, all the assistant coaches, all their family, all their kids. And, um, and, and so those are rough times, but um, we built enough character <laughs> this last month of October and November to last us a lifetime. But after all of this, we asked the coach, is it harder to keep that competitive fire alight in his team, in his staff, and maybe most importantly, in himself. 
Yeah, it is harder to keep the fire stoked. Um, I don't think that's been our problem this year. Um, our kids had showed real good character through the, the month of uh, October and November, you know, through losing that many games in a row. It kind of takes a spark out of it for, for anybody. But um, I, I felt like our team kept great character, kept great enthusiasm throughout this miserable ending of the season. And um, that, that creates great hope, too, I think. Things seem to start well enough. Uh, this season, but uh, talk a little bit about the the November slide and, and what exactly happened uh, to the miners uh, during that six game losing skid. Well, if I had um, a recipe or an antidote for what happened to us in late October and November with our skid, uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd probably be on an uh, infomercial selling it to corporations and other pro football teams and stuff like that. So I don't have the answer. Um, I've got an idea of, of what went wrong and, and what we need to do, and we'll make those changes over the off season. But um, you know, sometimes if it isn't broken, don't you know, don't change it. But um, you know, it, it's it's broken right now. It's not working the way I want it to work. And uh, we have a structure, we have a system that we work within. We're going to keep that structure, that discipline, that system going. But there are some changes and some major major changes that we'll be making in the off season uh to improve um to improve this slide that would that that happened to us so uh, i'm anxious to see if our de ideas are going to work we're anxious to get back and work hard with the team in the off season but one of the things we are going to stress is fundamentals blocking and tackling uh, we got to be better at both of those defensively there seem to be a, a lot of uh, questions asked at the wrong times by some of the defensive uh, players are they, are they questions answered by uh, finding a remedy, or is it uh, more a question of recruiting and, and gaining experience? Well, I think there's a lot of questions about what we did defensively uh, because, uh, you know, we do, uh, statistically we were so poor. Um, I think for um, maybe three reasons. Um, we need to get better defensive players. We need to put the players in the right position with the schemes and those kind of things through coaching. You know, and then uh, I think the third factor that probably made us look so unbalanced was, gosh, the people that we went against. You know, Texas Tech and their uh, their quarterbacks, one of the finest quarterbacks in the country. New Mexico State's quarterbacks, one of the finest in the country. Chase Clement, the Rice quarterback, all of a sudden he's developed into to be one of the best passing quarterbacks in our league. Paul Smith from Tulsa, wow. Then you look at the running backs. You look at Tulane. You look at uh, uh, Southern Miss. And, of course, the, in the game that we finished off against against Kevin Smith in Central Florida, he's probably the best running back in, in the country. So we went against some hype. We went against four or five of the top running backs in the country, the whole country. We went against three or four of the best quarterbacks in the whole country. And uh, that's tough for anybody. They got good statistics against a lot of teams this year. But the question is, how much is bad defense really about the talent on the other team in a conference that didn't finish with a single member ranked in the top 25? Well, um, I think at every level, the biggest difference is defense. At every level, the biggest de uh, difference is probably defensive line and offensive line. As you get... Um, to your major, major schools, your so-called BCS schools, the major difference between us and them is going to be on the defensive line and maybe on the offensive line. Um, when you go against the pros, when a college team goes against the pros, it's going to be those areas that are going to be better and speed. But, you know, Johnny Lee Higgins can play for anybody in the country. You know, uh, Thomas Howard can play for anybody in the country. Um but the USC's of the world and, and those and LSU's and, and those schools just have more of them and, and more probably in the defense and offensive line than uh, schools in our conference. But, but our conference, when it comes to backs and, and receivers and uh, running backs and quarterbacks, uh, our conference is as good as it gets. Our conference is as good as it gets in those areas. What challenges do you see at a school like this? And uh, do you think that uh, you've been able to 
clear the hurdle with at least some of those that have been in place for a very long time here. Yeah, I feel real strongly about the support of the president's office, the administration, our athletic director, this community has supported us. Yeah, you know, we didn't sell as many tickets as we would have liked to and didn't get as many people at the game. But still, there's a lot of solid people out there that are supporting us. And we'll pick up those other ones as we win more games. Uh, we're there. We're ready. There's three games I can point out right now that we felt like we should win and uh, – that would have put us in a bowl game right now, just easily, just three games that were winnable games, that we had a chance to win, that we were ahead of, and that I feel, as a coach, we should beat those teams, uh, and we didn't. And um, that's the that's the thing that sticks out the most is we let that go. We're a young team. We're the youngest team. We're the youngest team in Conference USA this year, and next year we'll be the uh, largest team with the returning uh, starters. It is interesting to note that throughout his most successful years, Price has been known as a man who coaches up rather than stares down. He has a good reason for that. A tragedy changed my mind with one of the players that I had. I used to be a grab-the-face mask, kick him in the butt, yell and scream and cuss at him kind of guy. And um, I had a player who uh, I loved very much and was a great kid, and in spite of me, he was a, a good, great player. And um, I never told him how I felt about him. I never told him that I loved him. I never told him that I wished that my son would grow up to be like him. All I did was yell and scream at him and be negative to the guy. And over the vacation, he was killed in a car accident. And I was never able to say that. And I said, hey, this is it. I'm not going to treat people like this anymore. I'm going to treat people with dignity and respect and um when someone needs a hug or a handshake or a pat on the back, I'm going to give it to them. And so it was really one incident in my life that kind of changed me. And I got in, started reading more self-help books, went to some orientations uh, uh, that were um, positive thinking type, you know, positive mental approach, and kind of got involved with that and saw just how powerful praise can be, how powerful respect can be, how you can lead through positive reinforcement, how you can go around and find people doing things right and yell and scream at them and say congratulations just as loud as, as you can going over and, and kicking him in the butt. And you get the same results, and people are a lot happier that way. And so that's kind of what changed, and that's why most of the time I'm a pretty upbeat guy, you know. And, um, but if there's someone that needs to be uh, talked to differently, um, I have no qualms changing uh, but I do I don't have the temper that I had when I was a younger man and who can argue with Price's overall record using this philosophy certainly no one as UTEP started conference play in 2007 though by the end of the season there may have been a few to the miners credit there was this at SMU Then this in the Sun Bowl versus Tulsa. Then the next week, this against East Carolina. That was followed all too quickly for Miners fans by this. And this against Houston. of times this season where you were tempted to switch philosophies, you know, kick over a chair or two and maybe tip over a table full of Gatorade or something? We tipped over the Gatorade table, we banged lockers, we've uh, done it all. I think uh, every coach is, is, um, is, you know, gets aggravated or upset about things, but uh, I think for the most part, you got to stay the course, and and if if you're changing all the time, then what do you stand for, you know? 
Uh, so you have to, if there's a certain belief system that you have and a certain way of treating people, then you need to, to, to do that most of the time. But sure, we're human. We lose our temper. Uh, sometimes people need that. Um, it's There's all different ways to lead people, inspire people, and um, motivate people. And fear and intimidation is one of the ways. And uh, it works. It's not a lot of fun sometimes, but some guys react to that. Other guys don't. So you have to be kind of a psychologist and be able to push the right button. And I think that's what... Uh, that's what some teams have done when they have these, all these great players, these professional coaches. You know, I don't know if they know more basketball or more football than the other coach, but they know what buttons to push. You know, uh, Bill Parcells knew what but buttons to push. You know, he, you can say one thing to one guy and you can't say the same thing to another. But really, the only inconsistency was the final score for a team that is getting much of its production from its underclassmen. It is decidedly different from 2006, when the question was more about heart than experience. UTEP's rushing totals didn't lie. You should at least have enough rushing yards to begin to challenge a five-year-old to count that high. The Miners would have flunked kindergarten in 2006. Compared to 2007, as Marcus Thomas in that much improved offensive line evened up UTEP's rushing stats with its passing totals. We knew we had a running back, and we've got some running backs still in our program. Marcus Thomas has been just a joy to coach and just a, a wonderful kid and, and a wonderful person and a wonderful young man is what he is. He's not a kid anymore. But the offensive line is really the, is, it, it came along so well for us. And O'Neill Cousins just had a great year and and uh, was probably the leader on that offensive line. And, and we'll have half of our senior class that's, gra that's graduating. Half of those kids are going to get an opportunity to play in postseason games, like the Senior Bowl, like the East-West Shrine Bowl, like the Hula Bowl, like the All-Star Game, like Texas versus the Nation. Half your senior class gets to play an All-Star Game. That's pretty good. You know, we're going to have, we could have three guys drafted, uh, you know, not free agents, but drafted, and, and uh, some guys could maybe even go as high as the first three rounds. So those are some those are some things that haven't happened uh, here for a while and needs to continue to happen every year. That We need to be consistently that good and produce those kind of athletes. With so many returning starters, there is already a bit of excitement for 2008, especially with the Texas Longhorns starting the Miners' home schedule September 6th. If UTEP's defense next season can mirror the offensive line's single-season leap, then perhaps things are looking up for the UTEP Miners. I, I think we've got some really good young players. I think the future looks really bright. Uh, we have we, we have over 30 players coming back next year that have started for the minors in a game. Over 30 players coming back. Uh, going into the season, we had about, about that same number who have never suited up for a game in a minor uniform before or been on a road trip going into the season. So it's going to be, the complexion of the team is going to be a lot different. So it's going to be a much more mature team, a much more experienced team, but it has to be a hungry team. We have to be hum hungry. We've got to be tough. We've got to be physical. Um, and that's what we'll be working on in the off season. But uh, I don't want an experienced team that coming back that, uh, you know, doesn't want to be better. We want, we have to, have a great passion and hunger to, to improve. Talk about recruiting right now and how things are going. Uh, have you had anybody who's been turned off by the record? Or do you see a bunch of players who say, hey, I could come in there and do something right now? Recruiting is not a perfect science. Um, it's, it's amazing. Right now we have 18 players who have committed to us. We have three players that are on campus uh, as part-time students. We call them gray shirting. They're paying their own way that will be coming in January. And then we have one other high school kid who has committed to us that will also come in January. So that brings us to 22 players uh, right now uh, that we have signed and ready to go be before recruiting hardly even starts, you know, before the recruiting time starts. So, um, you know, the last game that we had, uh, we had the worst crowd. Uh, and we had we only had six players in. Uh, we lost. We played terrible. All six guys want to come, so go figure. You know, I mean, a year ago we got we get, we were playing really good, and Jordan Palmer's our quarterback. He's a senior. 
we're leaving. You know, he's he's doing really well um, in the game. We win the game. He throws a bad pass. A couple people boo. The quarterback that I was recruiting didn't. His parents didn't like that, and he ended up going to TCU. <laughs> so you know, so that's one thing, one little incident in a great game, and it was enough to affect him. So. Um, just most of the time, you just hope that things are positive, that you win. Uh, but they might, they might those kids might have looked at us and said, hey, we can play for this team. But I think anybody that comes here on a Saturday night, whether it's packed, whether uh, the fans um, or our fans aren't negative. Our fans are pretty darn positive. And um, anybody that comes here, it, that's this is a good experience. This is a good experience. It's a positive experience. People like it when they come to the games here. A lot of spirit, and um, and so that's why we recruit during the season. And so, what next for Mike Price and the UTEP Miners? As many questions as there are about his young team, Price will be here to try and answer them as he looks to ride triumphantly into a desert sunset. I like just about everything about El Paso. I like three things. I love the people. I love the weather. I love the Mexican food. This is a special, special place. The people here are really special. I don't know if it's the Hispanic culture that is so appreciative and so polite and so family-oriented. I just, um, I love it. I, I just think it's, it's as nice a place as I've ever lived. For Metro Sports Southwest, I'm Duke Keith.